So let's start our recording. Okay, so we're continuing on with the chapter seven notes, looking at reactions of alcohols and methods to prepare alcohols. So as an introduction to the common methods available to prepare alcohols or ways of making alcohol derivatives, we're gonna talk about oxidation and reduction. And as such, it's important to talk about calculating oxidation states and oxidation numbers. So the oxidation state indicates the relative amount of electron density on each atom, assuming all bonds had ionic character. You can calculate the oxidation number by taking the valence electrons minus the lone pair electrons minus the bonding electrons times one half. And in this case, we have to be careful on how we count bonding electrons. So for calculating oxidation state, you assume the electrons in each covalent bond are assigned to the most electronegative atom in the bond. So for example, for hydrochloric acid, which of these two atoms is the more electronegative atom? The chlorine. Yep, chlorine, yep. So you can view hydrochloric acid as from the perspective of oxidation numbers as almost like an ionic compound. So if we calculate the oxidation number for hydrogen, hydrogen typically has a group number of one, it typically has one valence electron, and currently it has zero. So that gives us an oxidation number of plus one, very common for hydrogen. In comparison, the oxidation number for chlorine, so chlorine typically has seven valence electrons, um, has a group number of 7a, and currently chlorine has eight lone pair electrons, so seven minus eight gives us negative one. Does everyone, does this calculation of oxidation number look familiar from general chemistry? This is a centerpiece of Chem 101 and Chem 102. Okay, so let's look at an example such as C2O4 2 minus. So drawing out a Lewis structure for this oxalate anion. The way that I like to think of oxidation numbers is I take my Lewis structure and I break and I assign my electron density in my bonds to each atom. So for example, if we think about this carbon oxygen bond, what's the more electronegative atom? Carbon or oxygen? Oxygen. Yep, exactly right. So we can think of oxygen as having all four of these bonding electrons. So I, I draw out sort of a depiction of how my electron density is arranged. Now, if we think about this carbon-carbon bond, if we have atoms of equal electronegativity, we do an even split of our electron density. So we have two electrons, they're evenly divided. So each carbon atom gets one electron each. Okay, so we've taken all of our bonding electrons and we've assigned them to the most electronegative atom. So if we just count the electron density, if we just count the electron density surrounding this carbon, we know that for the oxidation number of carbon, carbon has a group number of four. How many electrons does carbon have under this oxidation number counting model? One. Yep. So then the oxidation number would be plus three. Likewise, if we wanted to figure out the oxidation number of oxygen, in this case, oxygen has a group number of six. It currently has eight electrons to its name. So that gives us an oxidation number of minus two. Now, one thing that I'd like you to note is that the total oxidation number 
is equal to the charge. So if we add up our oxidation numbers for carbon, so we have plus three times two because we have one, two carbon atoms, plus, and then for oxygen, we have minus two, and we have how many oxygen atoms in this structure with a minus two oxidation number? Four. Four, yep. So we have six minus eight, and that gives us negative two. And as we see, our overall charge is two minus, so that checks out. This is an important check that you should always do when assigning oxidation number. Does that idea make sense to everyone? Does this process of calculating oxidation number look familiar? Um, professor, really quick, where did you get the one and the eight from again? Where did I get the one and from what numbers? Could you please repeat that? The oh, the one. the one and eight. So the one I got because looking at this picture, after assigning the electron density in our bonds to the most electronegative atoms, carbon as drawn has one electron to its name. Oxygen as drawn has eight electrons. Does that make sense? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. thank you. Professor, I have a question. Yes, please go ahead. Um, even if the the other two oxygens have a double bond, it's always going to have that eight um, electrons. In general, you assign, you assign the electron density to the most electronegative atom in the bond. So for a carbon oxygen bond, whether it's a single or double bond, in both cases, oxygen is more electronegative. So the electron mm -hmm. density in that bond is assigned to oxygen. Oh, okay. Thank Does you. that make sense? Yes, thank you. Perfect. So let's talk about methods to make alcohols from carbonyl compounds, such as ketone derivatives. And the primary method to prepare alcohols from carbonyl compounds is via reduction. So if we think about the oxidation number of a carbon atom in a dialkyl ketone, okay, so this functionality is known as a ketone functionality. Specifically, a ketone refers to a carbonyl. So this CO functionality is known as a carbonyl. And when there are two R groups attached, we call it a ketone. Now, if we think about and we make a diagram of how our electron density is distributed from an oxidation number perspective, this carbon oxygen bond, all the electron density belongs to oxygen. For the carbon carbon bonds, it's an even split. R is, uh, refers to any generic alkyl group. So as we can see, currently as drawn, if we calculate the oxidation number for carbon, carbon has a group number of four. How many electrons does carbon have to its name? Two. Yep, exactly right. And that gives us an oxidation number of plus two. Positive oxidation numbers imply that your carbon atom is relatively oxidized and it's relatively electron deficient in most cases. Now, let's look at what happens when we've added a hydrogen or a hydride equivalent. I like to think of oxidation and reduction in terms of hydride or H minus equivalents. Reduction installs or adds hydride equivalents while oxidation removes hydride equivalents. So let's calculate the oxidation number of a carbon atom in a secondary alcohol. So in our model, the carbon-carbon bonds are evenly split. We split our electron density evenly between our carbon atoms since they have the same electronegativity. Carbon-oxygen bond, oxygen takes all the electron density. Now for a carbon-hydrogen bond, which atom is more electronegative, carbon or hydrogen? The carbon. Yep, exactly right. So now, so looking at this alcohol in particular, 
looking at our calculations, looking at our calculations for the oxidation number, we see that the oxidation number in this case is our group number of four minus the number of electrons, four, which gives us zero. So as we notice, when we add a hydride equivalent for when we add an H minus equivalent, our oxidation number decreases by two. Does that make sense to everyone? For those who are curious, if we looked at, for example, a tertiary alcohol, we would see that the oxidation number is plus one. So depending on the substitution pattern of your carbon atom in your alcohol, you will have slightly different oxidation numbers. The second point that I want to bring up is that reduction of a carbonyl compound gives an alcohol, and this occurs through addition of an equivalent of H minus or hydride added to the ketone carbon. This is important because most common reducing agents are hydride equivalents. Does that idea make sense? Does everyone see how the hydride equivalents and how during reduction when we add a hydride equivalent, our oxidation number becomes more negative? Okay, so many common reducing agents are hydride equivalents such as lithium aluminum hydride, sodium borohydride, diisobutyl aluminum hydride. And in all cases, reduction typically involves installation of a hydride equivalent. Now, different, different reducing agents install hydride in slightly different ways. Um, but I always like to think of hydride equivalents as a source of nucleophilic hydride. And we'll see that many of the mechanisms for reduction, specifically hydride reduction, are very similar to nucleophilic attack of carbonyls. So any questions so far? Okay, so let's talk about the general mechanism of reduction using a hydride equivalent. So it's a two-step mechanism, very similar to the addition of Grignard reagents and other nucleophiles into carbonyls. In the first step, we have addition of hydride into our electrophilic carbonyl carbon. This generates an alkoxide ion that can be intercepted and can be further reacted if needed or it can just be protonated with H3O+, just protonated with an equivalent of acid. So it's almost identical to the mechanism for Grignard addition. Any questions on this hydride reduction mechanism? Okay, so let's keep going then. And let's talk about methods to prepare alcohols via the reduction of aldehydes and ketones. So reduction of aldehydes gives us the primary alcohol. 
So in aldehyde, if we look at the oxidation number, what is the oxidation number for the carbon in an aldehyde? What is the oxidation number for the carbon in an aldehyde? Plus two. Plus two, let's, let's take a look. So the electron density for the carbon oxygen bond belongs to oxygen. The... Sorry, I was thinking of a ketone. Ah, that's okay. Uh, we'll, uh, now, looking at the aldehyde, what would you think the oxidation number would be for this aldehyde? Plus one, yep. As I see in the chat, we see a lot of plus ones. So the main difference is we've replaced an alkyl group with a hydrogen. So carbon-hydrogen bond, carbon's more electronegative, so it owns those two electrons in the bond. So then for our oxidation number, we get four, which is the group number for carbon, minus three, which is the number of electrons that carbon currently has to its name under this oxidation number electron counting method. And that gives us plus one. Now, without doing extensive calculations, though you can if you want, would someone like to guess the oxidation number of a primary alcohol after the addition of a hydride equivalent? What would you predict the oxidation number to be? Minus one. Yep, exactly right. So anytime you add an equivalent of hydride, your oxidation number will decrease by two units. So let's prove that. So for a primary alcohol, so we have an even split, carbon gets all the electrons from the carbon hydrogen bond, oxygen gets all the electrons from the carbon oxygen bond. So for our oxidation number perspective, we have four minus five, which gives us minus one. Exactly right. So as we notice, addition of hydride changes our oxidation number by two units. And, and a second thing I'd like you to note, reduction of an aldehyde gives us a primary alcohol. So this is a wonderful method to prepare primary alcohols that you'd otherwise have to get through hydroboration or other methods. Does this first example, does this first example um, make sense? Yes, please go ahead. I have a question. So um, I understand that the Oxygen is the most electronegative element in the in the alcohol, in the yep. primary alcohol. And then, um, is the is the R more electronegative or less? The R, the R is, is, is referring to a typical alkyl group, such um, as such as like um, such as like a methyl or ethyl group. So it's the R group refers to a carbon substituent. Oh, so it's it's like sharing those two electrons with uh, it, it's 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 just like if you thought of it as like a CH three group. And okay. When you look for a carbon carbon bond, both of these carbon atoms have the same electronegativity. So as a mm -hmm. result, the electron density in that bond, when we count electron density for oxidation number, is treated as equally split between the atoms. Oh, it's split. Okay. okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, and for the hydrogen, it's it's all going to the carbon, right? Yes, because carbon is more electronegative. So the electron density in the carbon-hydrogen bond belongs to the carbon. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on this? Okay, so as we've seen previously, reduction of ketones gives us secondary alcohols. So if we think about the oxidation number in a ketone, just as a refresher, what is the oxidation number for a ketone? Plus two. Plus two, exactly right. So we have four minus two, that gives us plus two. 
So what would we expect then for a secondary alcohol? As we discussed previously, what is the oxidation number for a secondary alcohol? Zero. Zero, exactly right. Okay, so we have four minus four, that gives us zero. So as we see again, addition of a hydride equivalent changes our oxidation number by two. Does this make sense to everyone so far? Any questions? Okay then, let's keep going. And let's talk about reducing agents and let's really focus on the different reducing agents and their uses. Sodium borohydride and lithium aluminum hydride are two different tools and they're used for two different purposes of reduction. Sodium borohydride is relatively insensitive to moisture and does not reduce other common functional groups. Lithium aluminum hydride is a more powerful, less specific reducing agent. So lithium aluminum hydride is used to reduce less reactive functionalities, while sodium borohydride is commonly preferred for simple reductions. So for the aldehyde reduction, when we have something like butanol, for example, we can reduce our aldehyde with an equivalent of sodium borohydride. And then from the intermediate alkoxide species, we can either use this intermediate for future reactions, or we can quench this intermediate. As I have alluded to multiple times, you only get the alcohol after the quenching step. Before then you have an alkoxide intermediate that you can leverage and use for further reaction. So sodium borohydride is really wonderful for the reduction of aldehydes and ketones. One thing that's pretty interesting is that you can have partial coordination of the oxygen to your boron atom to help facilitate this reduction process. Sodium borohydride is a, is a chelating reducing agent. Um, so you can often see acceleration of your reaction if you have coordinating groups. Anyway, so two key points to consider. Reduction is a nice way to make these anion equivalents that are often pretty tricky to make if you have other functional groups. And by deciding what you quench with, you can even alkylate this alkoxide intermediate. So it's always important to think, how can we leverage these methods and what is actually happening mechanistically? Is everyone comfortable with the mechanism for aldehyde and ketone reduction? Okay, so why do we ever have to use lithium aluminum hydride? Well, lithium aluminum hydride is wonderful for the reduction of carboxylic acids and esters. Now, one thing to note, carboxylic acids and esters are typically reduced to give primary alcohols. It's very hard to stop at the aldehyde using these reagents. As you notice, as you notice, if we compare our carboxylic acid carbon and our product alcohol carbon, um, to answer the question in the chat, yeah, alkylation to make an ether. Yep, it's a very classic way of leveraging this reduction alkylation procedure. Yep, 
That's a really nice proposal in the chat that we'll actually talk about next chapter. Okay, um, continuing on, looking at our carboxylic acid and looking at our alcohol, how many hydride equivalents did we add? So we're starting off with an oxidation number of plus three. And how many hydride equivalents did we add? If we have a primary alcohol, we have an oxidation number of minus one. So how many hydride equivalents did we add? How many hydrogens did we install? Two. So we have two H minus equivalents added. Now, this is an important point to consider. A single equivalent of lithium aluminum hydride and sodium borohydride, they have multiple hydride equivalents that they can donate. Usually you use an excess. Usually you use an excess of your reducing agent when you're reducing a carboxylic acid or an ester. The reason for that is even though lithium aluminum hydride can potentially donate multiple hydride equivalents, the first hydride donation is usually the most efficient. So lithium aluminum hydride is used because sodium borohydride does not efficiently react with carboxylic acids and esters in most cases. An excess of lithium aluminum hydride is required and you generally see selectivity for the ester or carboxylic acid in the presence of alkenes. There, there are some cases, however, that you do need to be a little bit careful with. So the carboxylic acid reduction occurs in, in, under reasonably facile conditions. The ester redu reduction also occurs under reasonably facile conditions. And it's important that we're able to draw out the mechanism and identify some intermediates. So lithium aluminum hydride, so we have our hydride equivalent. It will attack our ester. And just like Grignard addition into an ester, we're gonna have two separate addition steps. Just like Grignard addition, we're going to make this tetrahedral intermediate. And then this tetrahedral intermediate is going to collapse. And we're going to get an intermediate aldehyde. I'm going to draw it in, in the line notation because writing out every CH is somewhat cumbersome. So does everyone see how after the first addition, we have an aldehyde? Just like in Grignard addition, where we, where we got an intermediate ketone. Now, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, your hydride equivalent, your second hydride equivalent is then going to go and react with our most reactive functional group. And because hydride is a particularly hard nucleophile, it prefers to react with the carbonyl over the conjugated alkene. In this second addition, just like before, when we reduce an aldehyde with any hydride equivalent, we get an alkoxide intermediate. So we've installed our second hydride equivalent and then our alkoxide intermediate is protonated during the quench step. Now, there are a few things to note. There are a few things to note. It is actually very surprising that we see selectivity for reduction of the carbonyl over the conjugated system, but that has been consistently observed in lithium aluminum hydride reductions. So does this mechanism make sense to everyone? 
Okay, now there are a few things that, you, that you'd wanna note. So for incompatible functional groups, and this is just a few of them. So <laughs> don't try to do a reduction with a chloride. So your halides are not very good. They'll usually get burned off during the reduction step. If you have an epoxide, the epoxide typically is not going to survive lithium aluminum hydride. It may survive borohydride depending on how careful you are. Um, in terms of other potentially incompatible functional groups, your halides and your epoxides are some that stand out as particularly labile functional groups to reduction, where lithium aluminum hydride will likely reduce these functional groups down. Any questions on incompatible functional groups and things that you need to be careful about when you're planning a reduction? I, I, I don't really understand why we can um, use that functional group in order to reduce. Could you go over it one more time? Ah, yeah. So the reason why chlorides and epoxides are not compatible with lithium aluminum hydride conditions typically is that the hydride can very readily function not only as a nucleophile, but as a base. So you can see potential elimination or you can see direct nucleophilic attack onto the electrophilic carbon. Okay, I see what you mean, thank you. Likewise, for an epoxide, hydride can quickly attack the epoxide just like any other carbon-centered nucleophile. Typically, this is quite a messy process. And as a result, generally epoxides, halides, and other relatively sensitive functional groups won't survive reduction with lithium aluminum hydride. They, may, they will survive reduction with borohydride. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Perfect. Now, there is one other thing that I want to bring up here. And let's just note this here. If you want the aldehyde, if you want the aldehyde, the main reagent substitution that you have to use is dibal, which is diisobutyl aluminum hydride. So diisobutyl aluminum hydride is selective for mono reduction. And in this case, you'd use one equivalent. Typically, it's easier just to reduce it down and then oxidize it back up selectively, as we'll see later on. So let's do some product prediction now. So we have the following ketone. I'd like us to predict the products of the following reaction and draw a mechanism for each reaction. So in this case, we have sodium borohydride and methanol. We have a ketone and then we quench with water. So would anyone like to try to draw a mechanism and predict the product for this reaction? So there's plenty of space on the class whiteboard. And as we work through this example over the next three to four minutes, I'd like to see students sharing their drawn proposed structures and proposed mechanisms in the chat as a photo or directly on the class whiteboard using the annotate tool. <laughs> 
So would anyone like to try to break out the annotate tool and try drawing a mechanism for this reaction? So this is a typical hydride reduction. So hydride is gonna attack our carbonyl carbon. We're gonna generate as an intermediate, as drawn we'll be generating an alkoxide intermediate. So that's what we get from step one. And what happens in step two? So once we treat with water, the alkoxide intermediate is then protonated to generate our alcohol. And that's what the student's drawing out right now, I believe. So let's have that last arrow to show the protonation step. And then we're almost done with this mechanism. Um, so in the protonation step, we should draw our arrow towards the acidic proton. So the alkoxide lone pair is gonna grab our acidic proton. Ah, so for the second step, Yep, thank you, perfect. So our alkoxide lone pair will attack the acidic proton. We break the oxygen hydrogen bond and that gives us our product alcohol. So let me clear annotations and let's redraw that. So sodium borohydride is a hydride equivalent going to attack our carbonyl carbon, breaking our carbon oxygen bond. That gives us the following alkoxide intermediate. And then from there, in the second step, an equivalent of water will protonate our alkoxide intermediate and in turn, we will generate our desired alcohol. Any questions on this reaction? Does this make sense to everyone? Where exactly does the methanol come into play? The methanol is just a solvent. Usually borohydride works best in coordinating solvents. So alcoholic solvents are commonly used for borohydride reductions because it activates the borohydride. This is often used as a modification when you don't have an alcohol or other strongly coordinated group already, strongly coordinating group already in your molecule. Does that make sense? It's just a solvent additive. Okay, yeah, it does, thank you. Perfect. Perfect. And of course, if you read the, when you read the literature and you look at other conditions related to these hydride reagents, there are many variants of borohydride, but the fundamental mechanism for this hydride reduction is always going to be the same. Okay, so let's look at this next mechanism. And this one, you'll need a little bit more space. That's why I've panned up to give as much space as possible. And I'd like us to predict the product of the following reaction. And I'd like us to draw a mechanism. And 
just in terms of sort of where I, where I weight the priorities, knowing the mechanisms is critical because you can leverage your knowledge of the mechanism to start to think of how this reaction can be modified and think about how the intermediates can be used for other more creative purposes. So let's take about four to five minutes and let's try to draw a mechanism for this reaction and predict the products. And don't be shy to share your responses in the chat, verbally, or in the available class whiteboard using the annotate tool. And really don't be shy. There's enough space in the class whiteboard for multiple students to annotate. And I find the act of, of putting pen to paper to practice these mechanisms is invaluable. Because a lot of the steps, it's very easy to say, oh, that makes sense. But until you start drawing it out, often it's hard to notice questions that you can add. So this is a hydride reduction with lithium aluminum hydride. And I'll just add that we're using an excess just to make it faster. So from our first hydride reduction, hydride attacks the ester carbonyl. Um, would you be able to draw the hydrogen in this case? Would you be able to draw the hydrogen installed? I know it's implied, but as it was explicitly formed in the previous step, I'll, I'll draw it in. Oh, okay, perfect, awesome. Yep, so our hydride equivalent attacks the ester carbonyl functionality, our tetrahedral intermediate then collapses and we get what intermediate out? So reduction of an ester, just like Grignard addition into an ester goes through an aldehyde or carbonyl, sorry, an aldehyde or ketone-like functionality. In this case, we're going through an aldehyde. And then that aldehyde is gonna be very reactive. So what's going to happen if we still have lithium aluminum hydride floating around? Perfect, after our second hydride addition, we make an alkoxide intermediate. And then from there, we can protonate that intermediate with water. Perfect. Yeah, that mechanism proposed looks completely reasonable. So let's clear that mechanism and let's redraw the instructor solution. But the drawn out mechanism was perfectly reasonable. So our hydride equivalent is going to attack our ester. That in turn gives us a tetrahedral intermediate. And I would keep this mechanism in mind for later because we'll be seeing more of this kind of general addition, collapse of the tetrahedral intermediate, 
further reaction. This, this mechanism is very common for carbonyl additions and carbonyl substitutions. Okay, so our tetrahedral intermediate will collapse and we'll kick out the only viable leaving group, which in this case is an equivalent of methoxide. And that in turn generates a very reactive aldehyde. Aldehydes are quite reactive. They're not very hindered and they're relatively electron deficient. So our second hydride equivalent will quickly attack our aldehyde we get an equivalent of alkoxide anion, which is then immediately quenched with water to generate our primary alcohol. As a byproduct, I'd like you to note, we generate methanol. So this can be useful if you're trying to isolate both a primary alcohol and the alcohol that was originally part of your ester functional group. Whoops, this should be protonated. There we go, perfect. We have our primary alcohol and then the alcohol that was originally attached as part of our ester functionality. Does this mechanism make sense to everyone? Okay, so let's keep going then. And let's look at the following example. So this time we have an alkene. Do I have to worry about this alkene? Is this alkene a problem for a borohydride reduction? No. Not at all. So the mechanism's exactly the same. So the aldehyde, our hydride equivalent, adds into our carbonyl carbon. From there, the alkoxide intermediate is then protonated with water and we get our primary alcohol. So the point that this example is trying to make is borohydride conditions and even lithium aluminum hydride conditions don't generally reduce alkenes. Borohydride is mild enough that it's very selective for ketones and aldehydes. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's keep going now and let's look at the following example. So in this case, we're looking at another lithium aluminum hydride reduction. And so just to review, this is a multi-step reduction mechanism that involves sequential addition of two hydride equivalents. So in the first case, it's important that you show the tetrahedral intermediate. So our hydride equivalent attacks our ester carbonyl carbon. Then from there, our tetra tetrahedral intermediate collapses to kick out an equivalent of hydroxide. And then from there, this primary, well, or well, this aldehyde is then reduced further with a second equivalent of hydride to yield a primary alcohol. Sometimes I get a little bit ahead of myself for this. It wouldn't be correct to call that a primary aldehyde. <laughs> 
from there in terms of isolating a neutral species, the alkoxide ion is protonated and that gives us our isolable primary alcohol. Does that make sense? Perfect. Okay, so one way that we can generate alcohols and substitute alcohols in particular from carbonyl compounds involves utilizing Grignard reagents. We've seen Grignard reagents used in the past two labs that we've covered, one involving Grignard generation and titration, and the other involving Grignard addition into a ketone. So Grignard reagents can be generated from alkyl, aryl, and vinyl halides through reaction with magnesium and ether or THF. So the product is an organometallic compound that functions very similarly to just a general carbon-centered anion. So these Grignard reagents are carbon anion equivalents. And they're very useful because they're easy to generate, relatively easy to handle, and they can generate a wide degree of molecular complexity. So in terms of the general mechanism, so for your Grignard reagent, your Grignard reagent will attack as a nucleophile. Think of it like an R minus equivalent. It will attack your electrophilic carbonyl carbon. And in turn, we would get an alkoxide intermediate which is then, as always, protonated with an equivalent of acid during the quench. So Grignard reagents are wonderful reagents for generating carbon-carbon bonds and generating substituted alcohols from aldehydes, ketones, and esters. Grignard reagents are strong nucleophiles because they're highly polarized they react very similar to a carbon-centered anion in practice. The beautiful thing about Grignard reagents is that they react with most functional groups via a 1-2 addition pathway. So in this case, phenyl magnesium bromide, which we've seen in our laboratory, can attack an aldehyde such as propanol to generate a substituted secondary alcohol. So any questions on Grignard reagents, their general mechanism for reactivity and their utility? Um, what is the one, two addition yeah, one, one two addition just refers to the fact that the addition occurs at the carbonyl carbon. Oh, and okay. Just like, for example, what we observed when we looked at hydride reduction uh, of an ester, for example, with lithium aluminum hydride, the reduction also follows a one two pattern where the reduction occurs with the attack at the carbonyl. We call this one two rather than the attack at the unsaturated carbon conjugated to the carbonyl that we call 1,4 addition. So okay. Grignard reagents, just like hydride reducing agents, are hard nucleophiles and prefer to add directly into the carbonyl carbon. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Perfect. 
So in terms of the mechanism of addition of our Grignard reagent, you can draw your Grignard as a carbon-centered anion. And the Grignard reagent adds directly into the carbonyl carbon and we generate an intermediate alkoxide ion that can be used in alkylation and other reactions. However, if we just wanna isolate our alcohol, then we can protonate the alkoxide intermediate and that gives us our substituted alcohol. Any questions on this mechanism? So one thing I want to discuss is the mechanism for Grignard formation. So if you have a halide and you treat it with magnesium, well, how do we actually get our Grignard reagent? Well, this is a very interesting mechanism because it's a radical reaction that's a non-chain reaction. It's quite strange when you think about it. So the first step, we generate a carbon-centered radical. And then in our second step, our radicals recombine and that generates our Grignard reagent. Although for the purposes of this class, it is okay for you to think of a Grignard reagent as a carbon-centered anion. If you think about what's actually happening in many of these reactions, you, the, the picture is a little more complicated. Um, so Grignard reagents are quite unique in terms of reactivity and they serve as wonderful functional carbon-centered anion equivalents. Any questions on the mechanism of reaction for Grignard reagents and how Grignard reagents are generated? If we don't have any other questions, let's talk about applications and let's talk about one of the main drawbacks of Grignard reagents. So Grignard reagents and acid-base chemistry. So if you try to react a Grignard reagent with a molecule that contains functional groups, you'll run in, that contains acidic functional groups, you'll run into some issues. Grignard reagents are basic, and can react with alcohols, amines, carboxylic acids, and other acidic and protic functional groups. pKa less than 20 is a good benchmark. This acid-base reaction can compete with nucleophilic addition. This is part of the reason why Grignard reagents must be protected from atmospheric moisture, aka water. And Grignard reagents react with acidic functional groups through a protonation mechanism rather than through addition. So for example, if you have a carboxylic acid and you use one equivalent of Grignard, all you're gonna do is you're, you're, you've essentially developed a really quick and efficient method to make, to make two methyl propane gas. Beyond that, you're not actually generating the desired alcohol product. Professor, I have a question. Yes. And what is the molecule attached to the oxygen that has a single bond? What is the molecule attached to the oxygen that has a single bond? Yes. This? No, the one that you were drawing. Which? Like the, no, um, it's it's on the same page, but the one with the with the oxygen that had the arrows being pushed. Oh, it's it's the same structure. These structures are the same. Oh, it's it's a H. Okay. 
Yep, I'm just drawing, oh, I see. You mean the atom. Yeah, I'm just drawing out this OH bond to showcase the, the, the deprotonation of our acidic carboxylic acid with our basic Grignard. Okay, thank you. Does that make sense? Yes. And if you have any questions, don't be shy to unmute and ask. So with this information in mind that Grignard's prefer to react readily with acidic functional groups, let's look at the following example and let's ask ourselves, would we expect the following reaction to proceed to completion? So looking at the following reaction as drawn, would we expect this reaction to proceed to completion? Uh, no, right? Exactly right. And would you be able to provide a reason why? Because the, um, the Grignard reagent is going to react with the react with the uh, hydrogen and that's going to cause uh, the an anion on the oxygen. Yep. So this alcohol is acidic and as a result your Grignard reagent rather than engaging in the desired nucleophilic addition reaction instead will participate in an acid base reaction. So anytime you have an acidic functional group in your molecule you have to be very concerned that your Grignard reagent will react with that acidic functional group. So rather than generating the desired addition product, you actually don't get any of that in this case. Instead, what you get is the acid base reaction product, which is this alkoxide intermediate. And then from there, when you treat with acid, you just reprotonate your alcohol and you're back to square one. So it wouldn't be correct to say that nothing happened. It's better to say nothing productive happened. The reason why I make this comment is that in some cases, you may actually find that it's easier to use a commercially available Grignard as a base. So sometimes you see it pop up if you need to deprotonate alcohol, people would add an excess of Grignard um, in order to also deprotonate the alcohol simultaneously in addition to other reaction processes. So Grignard reagents can function both as nucleophiles and bases and in the presence of acidic functional groups, Grignards will react via acid-base reaction before any addition occurs. Does this example and does this limitation of Grignard reagents make sense? Is that a radical arrow from when you go from the... Uh, uh, no, 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 it's a double-headed. Okay. So is that going to the hydrogen? Yep. Okay. The Grignard reagent as a base pulls off and deprotonates the hydrogen. And then we break the oxygen-hydrogen oxygen bond as part of the deprotonation step. Okay. Professor? Uh, yes, please go ahead. I was going to ask, um, how can we identify whether or not the reaction is going to be, or whether or not that reagent that Grignard is reacting with is uh, too acidic to proceed? Generally, if it has a pKa of less than 20, or if it's an alcohol, carboxylic acid, those are two very acidic functional groups, as well as for example, thiols, which are a relative of alcohols, any group with, with a, or, or an amine, any group that can donate a proton with a pKa of less than 20, the Grignard will immediately go for that proton before it engages in any productive reaction. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. I was just wondering how to tell if it, if the pKa wasn't stated. <laughs> 
but that makes sense. So we explained um, it. In terms of if the, if the PKA wasn't stated, you have tools, and I believe I have it listed in the chapter two notes from 112. There are tools to estimate PKAs, um, but generally most generic alcohols, amines, carboxylic acids are sufficiently acidic. Um, okay. And, yeah, and that's why you'd see acid-base reaction compared to addition reactions. Is this the same like idea as to why we can't have any moisture? Yeah, it's, ex it's the exact same principle because rather than this, like for example, this alkyl chain, think it's the same way that Grignard's react with water via deprotonation. Any protic solvent or protic functional group will react and quench our Grignard. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Perfect. So let's now look at some reaction of Grignard reagents with carbonyl compounds. So we can add Grignard reagents into aldehydes. And this reaction occurs very efficiently to yield primary alcohols if you're dealing with formaldehyde, secondary alcohols if you're dealing with normal substituted aldehydes, and you can get tertiary alcohols from ketones. So Grignard reagents provide us a way to generate substituted primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohols with a range of structural variation. As we can generate and we have methods to prepare a range of substituted alkyl halides. The alkyl halide group is one of the easiest functional groups to install. So we really have a range of tools at our disposal to generate a range of unique structures. Does this idea of the different potential structures we can make using Grignard reagents and the different types of substitute alcohols we can make from Grignard reagents make sense to everyone? In each case, the overall mechanism is the same. Okay, so let's keep going then. And let's talk about the reaction of esters and Grignard reagents. So esters yield tertiary alcohols in which two of the carbon substituents come from the Grignard reagent. So it's important that you use at least two equivalents of Grignard for a complete reaction of your ester. One equivalent of Grignard will give a mixture of the alcohol and ketone product. And that is not good. Grignard reagents, unfortunately, do not add to carboxylic acids as they undergo an acid-base reaction, generating the hydrocarbon of our Grignard reagent. It's important to note, and this is a pattern to recognize, anytime you have a tertiary alcohol with two identical functional groups that I call R, that is an important point of pattern recognition because these particular substituted tertiary alcohols are very easy to make from the ester and a Grignard reagent. So let's showcase the mechanism. Let's showcase the mechanism for that. So let's suppose we have a generic ester. And I'm going to use R for my alkyl chain to make this really generic. We are going to add a Grignard. Let's keep it simple and let's do phenyl magnesium bromide in ether. So in our first step, just like reduction of an ester, our Grignard will attack the electrophilic carbonyl carbon. From there, 
will generate this tetrahedral intermediate. Now, of our leaving groups, the easiest leaving group to kick out is our methoxide equivalent. I mean, carbon-centered anions are pretty hard to kick out as leaving groups. Carbon in general is not a very good leaving group. So we get this intermediate ketone. Unfortunately, this ketone is not particularly easy to isolate because under the reaction conditions, it's immediately going to be attacked by a second equivalent of your Grignard reagent. And unfortunately, you can't just use one equivalent because in terms of reactivity, what is more reactive? What carbon is more electrophilic, an ester or a ketone? In general, which carbon is more electrophilic, an ester carbonyl carbon or a ketone carbonyl carbon? What is more electrophilic? So if we compare a ketone and an ester, so just as a sidebar, a ketone has donation from the alkyl groups. Well, an ester carbon, rather than having just inductive donation or sigma donation, the ester substituent donates electron density into our carbonyl functionality. And in turn, based on this information, which of these carbons, the ester or the ketone carbonyl carbon is more electrophilic? Which of these carbons is more reactive? The ester or the ketone? The ester carbon. So if the ester is receiving donation from the ester bonded alcohol group, I would that make the ester more or less electron rich? More. More. So as a result, would the ester carbon be more or less electrophilic? Oh, less, less electrophilic. Exactly right. So then what is more reactive, the ketone or the ester? The ketone. The ketone, exactly right. So if we add just one equivalent and we're slowly generating ketone, we're gonna get a mixture of the alcohol and the ketone and we'll just get a mess. So that's why we often add an excess of Grignard. This reaction only works best if you're looking for addition of two Grignard equivalents. So our second equivalent of Grignard reagent will attack and will generate our bis alkylated product. And then with just one equivalent of acid, we protonate and that in turn generates our desired alcohol product. Does this mechanism make sense to everyone? So we can generate highly substituted tertiary alcohols from esters, but two equivalents of Grignard reagent are added and incorporated into our final product. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, so let's try to apply what we've learned here 
and we have the following two reactions, and I'd just like you to predict the products. If you can draw a mechanism to justify your product prediction, that would be wonderful. But let's aim to predict the products of this reaction. Uh, professor, could you score back up to the other page really quickly? Sure. Do you have a question? I just wanted to finish writing it down really quick. Sorry. I, I was almost done. No worries. Any other questions that I can address? Okay, I'm good on that one now. Thank you. Perfect. So let's try to predict the products from the following reactions. You can either share the name of the product, you can draw a structure using the annotate tool, or you can share a picture of your product drawing in the chat. So let's work on this example over the course of the next four to five minutes, and let's try to get some responses from the class in the chat, shared verbally, as pictures in the chat, or using the annotate tool and sharing your responses on the class whiteboard. So don't be shy to share your, your responses or any questions that you have. So what does the class think? Would anyone like to try sharing their proposed responses using the annotate tool? You can also share a picture of your proposed structure in the chat. So we have the following two reactions and let's try to predict the products. So does anyone have any suggestions? So in the first case, we have an aldehyde reacting with a Grignard reagent. In the second case, we have an ester. So what products would we get out from these two reactions based on what we discussed? So in the, in the case of an aldehyde, we observe monoaddition of our Grignard reagent to give our monoalkylated product, which is a secondary alcohol. Yep. So let me redraw what your classmate has proposed. So our Grignard reagent will attack our aldehyde and we get out after the quench step a secondary alcohol. So just to show the intermediate after the first addition, we have the alkoxide intermediate, which is then protonated. And we generate our desired secondary alcohol product. 
Yep, that looks great for the first reaction. Would anyone like to propose the product from the second reaction? So we're dealing with reaction of an ester and a Grignard reagent. And as we talked about previously, what products do we observe when we react an ester and a Grignard reagent? So would anyone like to share their responses on the class whiteboard or in the chat? I have someone commenting, we'll get a tertiary alcohol. Yes, but let's be a little more specific here. What's the structure of that tertiary alcohol? And it's okay, multiple students can annotate at once. It's great to have a robust class discussion. Okay, so as we've noted, when we have an ester, we see addition of two equivalents of our Grignard reagent into our ester. So the drawn products predicted, one thing to note, uh, the, the Grignard reagent is ethyl magnesium bromine. So for the structure in blue, there just needs to be one more carbon on each of the Grignard substituents. Perfect. So the product prediction looks great for this reaction. So when we have an ester, our Grignard will add sequentially and we'll add two equivalents of Grignard. That's because the first addition, I'll draw everything out just for clarity. We get a tetrahedral intermediate that tetrahedral intermediate collapses. We get an intermediate dialkyl ketone. And then our second equivalent of Grignard adds in to the dialkyl ketone. And that in turn generates our desired tertiary alcohol. Perfect. So this is a good stopping point for today. We'll save the last example on this page for review for next time. And do we have any questions before we close out today's lecture session? Okay, if we don't have any other questions on our discussion of chapter 17, we'll stop today's lecture session.